I've mentioned before, and it's something, of course, that all of us are aware of many times in a very personal way, and that is the fact that we live in a very convenience-oriented society. And one of the things that ties in with that uh, is that with the emphasis on and the love of convenience that uh, is so much a part of our uh, late 20th century Western society, uh, together with that, uh, we so often find a great lack of commitment. Uh, very few people are deeply committed to anything. Increasingly, it's evident that uh, how many people are deeply committed uh, to their marriage? Uh, you, you know, one of the things that uh, has been uh, in the uh, in the news in terms of uh, uh, sort of uh, society news or society uh, gossip uh, has been the uh, the big hoopla concerning uh, the uh, wedding uh, of a particular well-known star, a very wealthy uh, woman who has uh, uh, who's getting married. That is, of course, the eighth marriage for Elizabeth Taylor. Now, as someone said, you know, it's sort of hard to get real excited about somebody uh, promising to love, honor, and obey until death do you part for the eighth time. Uh, it, it sort of uh, uh, undermines a little bit the uh, concept of any level of commitment. You almost wonder why bother. Uh, you, you know, what's, what's the point uh, that, uh, you, you know, what's there to get excited about? Uh, what, what's the uh, what's the point of that? Well, she, of course, because of her uh, fame, because of her wealth, uh, because of her notoriety over the years, uh, sort of stands out as an example of that. But uh, there are many, many, many others who may not have actually walked down the aisle eight times, though there are certainly others that have. I'm sure uh, she doesn't by any means hold the record. But... Uh, they're, they certainly evidence a lack of any particular genuine commitment uh, in their lives. Uh, there was a recent uh, Gallup poll uh, that was taken uh, dealing with people uh, observing the ten, uh, believing in the Ten Commandments. Now, generally, when they've taken polls and they have asked people, uh, do you believe in the Ten Commandments, they get a real high yes answer. People say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I believe in the Ten Commandments. They did something a little different. They ask a question related to each one of the ten. And they said, what about this? Do you, do you think this is any big deal? Well, what it came down to was most people didn't think any individual one of the commandments was any big deal. I think murder uh, got, most people felt like that murder was, that they really ought to keep that one. Uh, you, you know, of course, <laughs> you wonder how much of it is their commitment to uh uh, self-preservation, and how much of it is their commitment uh, to believing in any particular moral code. Uh, you get down, uh, needless to say, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath receives the uh, smallest uh, number who thought that was important. Uh, but really, uh, more than, uh, less than half of, of people thought that most of the commandments were important. Murder, most people thought was important. I think murder and stealing were the only ones that made it above 50%. Uh, but stealing, uh, when they ask a couple of specific questions uh, about, you know, stealing under these circumstances or that circumstances, uh, basically the circumstances involve very little likelihood of you getting caught. Uh, the percentage who thought that it was wrong to steal, uh, if nobody was going to find out, uh, was really not all that great. Uh, they they were sort of opposed to people stealing from them, uh, and they didn't think you ought to steal if there was a good likelihood you were going to go to jail. But uh, if they thought they could get by with it, they weren't all that opposed to it. And it went down the list of various commandments. You know, lying, uh, well, if it'll get you out of trouble, it's not too bad. You know, about 80% thought that lying wasn't bad uh, under, you know, uh, the circumstances where it would be helpful. Uh, so, you, you get down to a very relative moral code, a very lack of any sort of commitment. Now, if you were to ask most of these people, are you a Christian? Over half the population uh, of the United States uh, certainly professes to be Christian. 
90 some odd percent uh, claim to believe in God. I think it's about 95, 96 percent claim to believe in God. Uh, the, the heavy majority will tell you that, yes, they are Christian. They believe in Christianity. But if you pin them down in terms of their level of commitment, you find that with their mouth, they may acknowledge and profess certain things, but there's no depth of commitment. There's no depth of conviction. There's no discipleship. Because Jesus talked about those who would be his disciples. And his disciples were those who would come after him, who would learn from him, who would be taught by him, who would follow him. Now, when he was here on this earth and he was going from here to there to somewhere else, following him uh, meant literally putting one foot in front of the other and following where he went. And when he stopped, you stopped. And when he talked, you listened. And when he traveled on a little further, you put your foot in the road and you followed on too. You didn't know where you were going to spend the night, wherever he spent the night. You didn't know where you were going to eat, wherever he ate. And there were various ones who followed him, uh, who gave up businesses, who gave up uh, the life, the settled life that they had led. You know, he came up to Peter and and Andrew, his brother, to John and to James, uh, who were commercial fishermen. And he said... Come on and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they put down their nets. They went with him. Obviously, we have just a brief summary account, and yes, they knew who he was or had come to know who he was. They they knew uh, he he was not a stranger that just sort of walked up and and transfixed them with some uh, mystical stare, and uh, they looked, and he had a halo around his head, and so they just sort of like in a trance, dropped what they were doing and followed. I think one of the Bible movies sort of gave that impression. You know, it was almost this this, this kind of mystical, uh, uh, hypnotic effect. Well, that's not the way it was at all. Uh, when you actually go through and study the account, these men uh, had actually known him for years. Uh, their families were related. There was a... But there had come... They, they had uh, been individuals who had been... Uh, had spent time with John the Baptist, had been disciples, at least in some cases, uh, of John the Baptist for periods of time, had, had spent uh, a number of weeks uh, with John the Baptist, listening to him. They had come to a conviction in their own mind, and when Jesus Christ challenged them to act upon that conviction, they did, because they believed it, and they were committed to what they believed to the uttermost depth of their being. There was a depth of commitment, and we find today in our society a great lack of commitment. People aren't even committed on a physical level. They're not committed in their marriages. Uh, Very few people are really committed to a cause that they believe. Uh, Most politicians read the opinion polls to find out whether it's popular to be for this or against it. Uh, And so after they've read the opinion polls and they decide it's politically advantageous uh, to be, you know, against abortion, well, they're against it. Or if they find out, oh, you know, opinion polls change, it's politically advantageous to be for it now, uh, well, then then they're for it. Uh, And a lot of them, of course, try to do the splits. They they try to be for it and against it at the same time uh, because they don't want to offend anybody. Uh, And and, uh, I'll tell you what, it's uh, it's really sort of funny, the... uh, uh, it's. Uh, I saw uh, saw one time we were back in Texas. I saw the uh, uh, the, the platform. Uh, you remember back in uh, some of you remember uh, back in 1960 when Lyndon Johnson ran for vice president on John F. Kennedy's uh, presidential ticket. Uh, the uh, this was also the year that his Senate seat was up for election. Texas passed a special law uh, that allowed him to run for the Senate at the same time he ran for vice president. It's the only, uh, normally he would have had to have given up his Senate seat, see, and if he lost the vice presidency, he'd just been out. Well, he didn't want to do that, so he got them to pass a special law that just applied to him uh, that allowed him to run for vice president and senator at the same time, which he did. Uh, But the interesting thing was, 
Then he ran on two totally different platforms. Uh, there was a platform that he ran on in Texas uh, as the platform of, of uh, what he claimed to represent if he was uh, reelected as senator from Texas, and then the platform that he ran on as vice president. They, they were totally uh, contradictory. Uh, many of the planks of the platform, he was for one thing as, as a senator from Texas and against something else, uh, against the same thing as, as uh, vice president. Uh, the point is, and, and he's not unique at that, he just sort of was in the, in the ironic situation of running for two things at the same time. Uh, now, a lot of politicians have done that. They just usually aren't embarrassed by having to do it at the same time. Uh, but the point is, very few people really have a depth of commitment. Even in a physical realm, there are, there are individuals, certainly, you could point out individuals in history who have been uh, committed to something, and whether it was popular or unpopular, they, they were committed to it, they believed in it. Uh, you or I may not, may or may not agree with what they were committed to, but you at least have to respect that, the fact that they, that they did have uh, commitment and faithfulness in that area. But the primary thing that I want to put our focus and our attention on has to do with our level of commitment, our level of commitment to being a Christian, to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because our level of commitment is something that should go far beyond uh, simply uh, uh, the things that we find in the society around. Now, there are two major things that I feel, are primary enemies of commitment. A lot of people, if you were to say, and certainly in a setting like this, are you committed to being a Christian? You know, we were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you are committed to being a Christian? I, I hope that, uh, you know, or, or certainly everybody who's baptized would raise their hand. Uh, say, how many of you are not committed to being a Christian? Well, they, you know, people start sitting on their hands. They, they don't want to say, no, no, I'm not committed uh be like the time the preacher was uh, preaching a revival and he uh, was trying to get somebody to come down the aisle and he said, how many of you want to go to heaven? Uh, you, you know, raise your hand. And uh, so, you know, it looked like everybody raised their hand. He said, everybody wants to, uh, wants to uh, go to heaven, stand up. And he looked and he saw there was one guy didn't stand up. So, boy, then he really went on. He thought he had a real center to, to, to preach to, you know. So he really uh, went on for a while. And so uh, he wanted, everybody who wanted to go to heaven, stand up. And, and uh, this guy still didn't stand up. So this went on for about three times. And finally, uh, he stopped and he singled the guy out. And he said, he said, what's wrong with you? He says, don't you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to hell? And the guy said, well, well no. He says, uh, but I just thought maybe you were getting up a load to go right now. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, kind of wanted to go, but no time real soon. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, the way a lot of people are. You know, they, they, they claim they want to go to heaven, but uh, they're not real anxious to get there. Uh, but uh, there are enemies to, to commitment. There are things that stand in the way, that undermine, that eat away at depth of commitment. I think the two primary things that undermine the depth of our commitments are, one, the pressure of trials and tests, and two, the enticements of worldliness. The pressure of trials and tests and the enticement of worldliness. Both of these can eat away at the depth of our commitments. You know, if you go through the story of Israel coming out of Egypt, you find that uh, we're told in the book of Exodus that when Israel left Egypt, they came out with a high hand. They were excited. They were enthused. They were now going to be free of Egyptian bondage. They were on their way out of Egypt. They came out with a high hand. And they were on their way to the promised land. The land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob centuries before. The land that they had heard of. The land that had been described as father had told son, had told uh, his son, and on down for generations. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the twelve sons of Jacob to their children to their grandchildren to their great-grandchildren. And it came on down. So these people had heard about this land. 
that someday we're going to get. Someday we're going, well, that had become rather unrealistic to them because as decade upon decade had gone by of Egyptian servitude, that, that seemed pretty remote, pretty far off. But now the unimaginable had happened, and that is the fact that they had left. They had experienced miracles, and they had come now, right up within sight of the promised land. We read the account in Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers 13, in verse 1, the Eternal spoke to Moses and said, Send men that they may search out the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers, send you a man, every one a ruler among them. Send one of the princes of each tribe. So it goes through and goes through the details uh, of the twelve men who were selected, who went into the promised land. And they went in and they searched the land. Uh, we're told um, uh, on down in, in uh, verse 21, and how they went through all through the land. And uh, verse 25, they returned from searching the land after 40 days. So they had spent about six weeks. They've been gone. People had just been camped. They didn't know what happened to them. You know, they didn't get telephone calls back and uh, you know, telexes and fax messages and uh, radio reports. Uh, the guys just left, uh, crossed the river, and uh, disappeared. Six weeks later, they show up. And they came in, and verse 27, they said, We came to the land where you sent us. And surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And it describes, you know, the size of the fruit. I mean, it took, uh, it took two of them to carry a cluster of grapes. They had to tie the thing to a uh, to a stick, and it took two of them to transport it. It was a pretty good size of a cluster of grapes. Uh, he said, uh, it, it's a tremendous land. It flows with milk and honey. Verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. We saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell in the mountains. Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome them. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against this people. They're stronger than we. And they brought an evil report of the land. And we're told in chapter 14, verse 1, the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the wilderness, or would God we had died in the land of Egypt? Verse 4, they said, Let's make a captain and let's go back to Egypt. Let's make a captain, let's choose, let's elect a leader. And let's return to Egypt. Let's return to the safety and the bond. Let's return to the safety of slavery. Let's return to the security we had of servitude and bondage in Egypt. Let's go back to the familiar. Let's go back to what we had. You know, it wasn't so bad. Pharaoh would probably be glad to see us. We could cut a better deal, get a little higher wages, and. Uh, Let's go back. How deep was their commitment? How deeply committed were they to following where God led and, and inheriting what God had promised? How deep was their commitment? It wasn't very deep at all. As soon as they were confronted by obstacles, as soon as they were confronted by the giants in the land, when they were confronted with things that to first glance, first appearance, seemed pretty overwhelming, pretty intimidating. Fear overwhelmed them. They were intimidated by a fear of what lay in front of them. They were intimidated by what they thought was in front of them, and the fact that they were intimidated by it sapped their commitment. The pressure of the trial, of the test. Because they were put to the test. See, God wants to know, not just do you want what he has to offer you, but how badly do you want it? Do you want it, well, you know, nothing else, I guess I'll take it. Or do you really want it? How badly do we really want what God offers us? How valuable are God's promises to us? What would you sacrifice for those promises? 
What would you give up in order to be Christ's disciple? Now, some people wouldn't give up anything. If it's convenient, then, you know, I'll be, you know, kind of carry me along the way, uh, make sure it's air-conditioned, uh, and, uh, you know, it's comfortable and it's convenient, and, yeah, I guess I'll be your disciple. I don't see anybody else around that's, you know, offered a better deal. Uh, but if I do, well, you know, I'll, uh, you know, quit here and go there. What's the depth of commitment? These people lacked a depth of commitment when... They were confronted. We could go through many examples. You know, Satan has trouble believing that anybody is deeply committed. Because the only thing he was deeply committed to was himself. And doing things his own way. In the book of Job, we find that in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the eternal. Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where have you come from? Satan said, From going up and down. Uh, to and fro in the earth, walking up and down on it. And the Eternal said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? You've been walking around and taking note of things. Have you ever noticed old Job down there? You know, there's nobody like him in the whole earth. Uh, he is a man who is perfect and upright. He uh, fears me, stands in awe and reverence of me. He eschews evil. There's nobody like Job. you ever noticed him? And Satan said, Well, I guess he does fear you. You pay him pretty well. You know, what, what, doesn't he get something out of it? Haven't you made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? And you've left the work of his hands and his substance has increased in the land? Well, I guess he does worship you. Sure he does. But look at all the stuff you give him. Why, he's wealthy and, and things go right for him. And the guy just, it's like he's got a hedge around him that protects him from anything going wrong. Of course he worships you. Why, you pay somebody that well, what do you expect? But I'll tell you one thing, verse 11, you put forth your hand and you touch him, you touch all that he has, he'll curse you to your face. He's not committed to you, Satan said. You're impressed with Job and how, how, faithful Job, how faithfully Job serves you. Why, Job doesn't have any depth of commitment. You let things start going wrong for him and you will find out how long he lasts. Why, he'll curse you to your face if you take away the things you've given him. Only reason he's, only reason he's doing it is because it's convenient for him. He doesn't have any commitment. The eternal said to Satan, all right. You, you, you wanna, you wanna find out? I'll, I'll let you have him in your power. The only thing that you can't do is harm him personally. You can do anything to his, to his wealth. You can do anything you want to to him as long as you don't uh, harm him personally. Satan said, all right, that's fair enough. You'll see. He'll curse you to your face. Well, came on down. Uh, verse 14, you know, there came a messenger unto Job. Uh, Satan didn't let his coattail touch his back. I mean, you go through and you read the account. You know, here's Job, and he doesn't know what hit him. All of a sudden, this guy comes up, and he says, the, the Sabines fell on us, and they, uh, you, you know, they slew all your servants, and they, they killed all your, uh, uh, you know, destroyed your farm, and, and I'm the only guy that got away. And uh, the next one said, um, verse 16, said, fire came down out of heaven and just consumed all your sheep uh, and, and your servants, and uh, I'm the only one that got away. All your herds wiped out. And while he was yet speaking, I mean, you know, this was not something that transpired over, this is not a compressed account of something that transpired over weeks and months. And Job sort of had a chance to kind of get over one thing, something else happened. I mean, we're talking about five minutes. Uh, you know, one guy standing here, and while he's there, the next one comes running in. And, says, and, and not only that, uh, but the Chaldeans came and they stole all your camels and killed all your servants. And while he was yet speaking... Another one came and said, you know, there came a storm and, and all your sons and daughters were together and they were having a, a meal and, and uh, uh, there came a big storm and blew the house down and killed them all. I mean, you know, five or ten minutes, everything Job had was gone. Just gone. His wealth, the sources of that wealth, his family... And 
Oh, this was pretty overwhelming. Verse 20, Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. You know, he, Job didn't do what Satan thought he would do. Satan said, if you touch what he has, he will curse you to your face. Job fell down on the ground and he worshipped and he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, Job was greatly grieved. And, you know, we certainly have a, a summation, but the point was, Job did not turn against God. Because, you see, Job had something that the devil couldn't understand, and that was commitment. Job was not just in it for the good times. Job did not serve God for the reason Satan thought he did. Satan misread Job because Satan could not understand commitment. He figured the only reason Job did it was because of what he was getting out of it. You take away what he's getting out of it, and he'll quit. He's not committed to you. Nobody's really committed. Job doesn't really love you and is committed to you. Well, if you take away what he has, he's not going to stick around. He's in it for what he gets. Well, a little later, sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came. God again called his attention and said, by the way, you notice old Job down there? There's nobody like him. And uh, you uh, destroyed him. You, 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 you uh, were allowed to destroy him without cause. And yet, uh, you know, he didn't do what you said, did he? Surprised, weren't you, Satan? You said he'd curse me to my face if, we took, if, if I let you take away what he had. And you took it and he didn't, did he? Well, Satan always has an answer. Verse 4, he says, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has will he give for his life. You let me take what he had, but you didn't let me hurt him. But you put forth your hand and you touch his bone and his flesh and he'll curse you to your face. Yeah, he might have been willing to give up that, but I'll tell you what, skin, skin for skin, man will do anything to save his own skin, his own life. And the Lord said, all right. That's what you think? Fine. You do anything you want to him, but you can't kill him. Short, short of taking his life, you can do anything you want. Satan went forth, and the first thing he did was smoke Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. Now, if any of you have ever had a boil, you know that one boil can be very miserable, very painful. Satan didn't give Job one boil. He gave Job boils from the crown of his head to the bottom of his feet. Uh, you know, one thing about it, Satan doesn't believe in half measures. If he gets the opportunity, I mean, he went all out. And uh, Job wound up finally sitting down in, a, in an ash heap trying to get some relief. Uh, and there, sort of an interesting study, if you want to look into it, as to why uh, that there are that there is a certain amount of, of uh, uh, about the only thing physically that uh, he could do. He gave a little bit of relief. Something had some give on it. Uh, also, took a pot shirt to scrape himself and uh, uh, his wife. Now, you know, Job, uh, Satan killed all the rest of his uh, his family. He didn't kill his wife. I think when you read verse uh, 9 and 10, you uh, understand why Job left, or why Satan left Mrs. Job around. Uh, because she didn't help matters any. Uh, you know, she uh, said, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Just get it over with. And Job said, you, you're you speaking foolishly. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Well, we, we can come on back, and I'm not going to go through all the book of Job, but Job understood as he records in Job chapter uh, Job chapter 14. In verse 14 he says, If a man die, shall he live again? 
All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. You shall call and I will answer you. You will have a desire to the work of your hands. Job understood that God had a plan and a purpose. Job, in, in chapter 13, Job said, in verse 15, Job 13, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. This was the depth of Job's commitment to God. Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I'll maintain my own ways, or I will approve my own ways uh, before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. So Job's friends were accusing him. said, Job, you've got to have some secret sins. There's something you're doing we don't know about. You must be a terrible person. Uh, well, you, you've got this good reputation. Everybody thinks you obey God. And, and boy, you must really be a horrible sinner or God wouldn't let all this happen to you. See, they just knew they had it all figured out. Job was a hypocrite, and Job, you know, everybody thought Job was keeping the commandments, and Job must be the most terrible person uh, imaginable. They just hadn't discovered the dirt on him yet. Uh, this was sort of their attitude. And Job said, uh, you know, told them, look, hold your peace. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Uh, he says, uh, you know, I trust God, and though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'll maintain, I'll prove my ways before him. Uh, because he's going to be my salvation, and I know uh, that a hypocrite is not going to come before him. And I'm not a hypocrite. I trust him for my salvation, and though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job had a depth of commitment. Now, there were lessons that Job needed to learn, yes. But you know, sometimes we, we have maybe focused in on certain lessons that Job needed to learn and have overlooked one of the great lessons that we can learn from Job. Because God was, God singles Job out. In fact, in the book of Ezekiel, you find Job mentioned as one of the three most righteous men who ever walked the earth. When God singles out three men, uh, he mentions Noah, Job, and Daniel. When he talks about the time's going to come that I'm going to destroy this society, he says, even if Noah, Job, and Daniel were standing right there, I'd save them, but I'd clean out the rest of them. They wouldn't deliver anybody but themselves. So, God was, God singles out Job in that way. There's a very important lesson that Job exemplified. Job exemplified many positive things. And one of the greatest, most important things that Job exemplified was commitment, a depth of commitment in the midst of the most horrible pressures and trials and adversities and difficulties that can be imagined. Now, there, there have been various ones who certainly have gone through uh, great trials, and some of you have gone through great trials and great difficulties. You know, we these can be economic, they can be uh, in terms of sickness and illness, they can be in terms of, uh, of uh, death uh, in, in uh, family members, uh, and uh, uh, they, they can be in a variety of things. And there are many trials that God's people have, have encountered, that some of you have encountered, some of us may encounter, none of us know exactly what we're going to face. And certainly there's nothing we're going to face that others have not had to face. But how deep does our commitment go? You know, the Israelites had a very shallow level of commitment. As soon as obstacles were thrown in their face, they were ready uh, to retreat and go back to Egypt because they had no depth of commitment. Job had a depth of commitment, and in the midst of the most horrible adversities imaginable, Job did not throw away his calling. Job was committed to something. There are uh, other examples that we could look through, different ways the trials, the pressures, the pressure of trials can come upon us to uh, uh, certainly to, to wear down, to discourage to sort of be overwhelming sometimes. Things can be intimidating. Well, those of you who were in the church back, uh, uh, you know, 12 years ago, uh, back in 1979, uh, remember the events that occurred when just seemingly out of the blue, at least as it appeared to most of us, of course there were those who had been involved in, 
in uh, stirring this thing up under cover, but uh, uh, just seemingly out of the blue, officials of the uh, uh, state of California uh, showed up uh, on the basis of all sorts of lies and false accusations uh, with court orders to uh, shut the work of God down in January of 1979. Move in, confiscate records, uh, just take things over, appoint uh, uh, a judge, uh, a retired judge as a, quote, receiver. Uh, Mr. Armstrong promptly dubbed him the deceiver, uh, said they misspelled that. Uh, he was not the receiver, he was the deceiver. Well, he was not the receiver because he wasn't going to receive anything. And uh, but there were a lot of people that were just completely overwhelmed and intimidated by that. There were those that immediately capitulated. It just felt like, uh, uh, you know, this thing's all over with. It's all over with. You know, there were others that, that didn't. There were others that kept uh, doing the work. Or those that rose to the to the occasion, you know, Mister at that particular point in time, uh, Mister uh, Mister Decotts was a uh, local church pastor in the headquarters area, had uh, pastored the uh, San Marino congregation, which is a short distance from Pasadena, and uh, uh, was uh, had been there in the uh, Pasadena area at that time for uh, about uh, twelve thirteen years, uh, having come there from Chicago about 12 or 13 years earlier, uh, and uh, had served in the ministry and served in the work. And uh, while many of those uh, who had been around as long and even longer than he had and who held higher offices and higher positions, uh, there were some of those that were uh, some of the quick uh, first to capitulate, to sort of uh, compromise, to try to cut a deal, because they, in their minds... They said, well, boy, you know, Mr. Armstrong is out, and this other guy, this judge, he's taking over. We better get in on his side. And, uh, you know, Mr. Dukacha's attitude was, well, who is this guy? You know, he's going to come over, he's going to come in here and take over the work of the living God? Forget it. He organized, he, he organized the church services there in the administration building, and, uh, uh, you know, called around. Pretty soon you had hundreds and then literally thousands uh, of uh, church members uh, from all over Southern California that showed up on campus. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, we're, we're not breaking the law. We're holding, we're holding worship services. And, uh, uh, you, you know, between him and uh, a few of our uh, somewhat uh, long-winded ministers, uh, they were able to hold the church services uh, around the clock. Uh, you know, those judges, uh, they thought that uh, Church of God ministers were going to uh, run out of wind and have to quit preaching. Uh, they didn't know uh, some of us, you know. That was uh, that was a challenge to be able to preach a sermon, not to have to watch a clock or quit on time. Uh, you know, hour after hour went by with singing and with preaching. So they, said, they said, as long as you're having services, we won't interfere. But when services are over, you guys are going to have to leave. Services never got over. I just kept on, you know, around the clock. Uh, you know, babies were sleeping. Uh, even the, that was one time it was okay to sleep in church. Uh, but, uh, you know, services just continued around the clock for days. Uh, and until finally they were the ones that capitulated and decided that this wasn't going to work. Uh, they, the, uh, but the point is, you know, it has to do with commitment. How deep do our commitments go? How easily frightened and scared away are we uh, when obstacles uh, come up? When adversity is thrown in our way? When it looks difficult, it looks impossible? Well, you can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Do we put limits on what God can do? Well, the pressures of trials can be a great enemy of commitment. But another enemy of commitment, in a sense, the opposite, is the enticement of worldliness. The enticement of worldliness. The, uh, there's an interesting story that is recorded for us uh, in the Scriptures uh, that uh, deals with another way of... Uh, being able to uh, entice people. And uh, this has to do, this is also found in the book of Numbers. This is the story of Balaam. This we come in Numbers chapter 22, 
uh, that Israel had wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and now the next generation came. The first generation had been overwhelmed. It lacked commitment. They had been overwhelmed by the trials and the adversities before them. Now, Satan has more than one trick. doesn't have, you know, any new ones around, but he's got some of the old familiar ones, so he trotted out a different one this time. Uh, he had stirred up Balak, the king of the Moabites, to send down for the great religious leader, uh, the Pontifex Maximus of the Babylonian mystery religion, uh, over in Pethor, which is up on the Euphrates River, uh, had uh, uh, sent for old Balaam. And uh, Balaam uh, had come down there. Balaam had really wanted to go because they offered him money. Uh, God had... Uh, let it be known that he didn't want Balaam to go. Balaam's attitude was one of going as far as he could go. He, Balaam would do anything he could get by with. Balaam had a certain attitude. In fact, you ought to go through, that's a good Bible study, to go through a little bit of the attitude of Balaam uh, toward obedience to God. You know, Balaam was willing to obey if God said, Balaam, you do that and I'm going to zap you. And so Balaam stopped. He didn't do that. But you remember the story. You know, God, had, I mean, God even sent a vision. He sent everything. Uh, he didn't want him to go. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Balaam kept saying, well, you know, what if I, what if I do this? And, and Balaam kept trying to figure a way to do what he wanted and get the money uh, and yet not directly disobey God and get in trouble. So God finally said, all right, Balaam, do anything you want to. So Balaam jumped up, jumped on the, on the donkey and took off. You know, what would you and I do if God said, all right, hey, you can do anything you want to. You know, you want to keep the Sabbath fine. If you don't, hey, do, do what you want to do. What do you want to do? Are you committed to being like God? Or if God said, uh, hey, okay, you know, you want to do it? God's already made plain what he wants. You, you remember the story. You know, he, he put a uh, put an angel there that, that Balaam couldn't see, but the donkey could, and the, and the donkey stopped and wouldn't go any further. Balaam began to beat on the old donkey, you know, and he got a stick. And if you've ever tried to move a donkey against his will, you realize that that is, is an impossible task. Uh, and uh, I, I had a donkey when I was a kid, and I know from first-hand experience that those things uh, are, are just almost the immovable object when they don't want to go any further. And Balaam's donkey was that way. He stopped, planted his feet, and wouldn't go. And Balaam just beat on the thing and pulled on him, and he was so frustrated, you know, he was saying everything he, uh, everything he could think of. And, and God just performed a little miracle there, kind of, uh, all of a sudden the donkey was able to speak. Uh, and and uh, he turned around to Balaam, and he says, what, what, what are you doing this for? He says, haven't I always done, you know, hadn't I, hadn't I been a good donkey? And Balaam said, yeah, but you're not now. <laughs> and the donkey said, look, uh, you, you know, what, what it amounted to was all of a sudden, uh, Balaam was able to realize that there was an angel there blocking the way. Now, the point was the donkey was smarter than Balaam. When the donkey saw that God didn't want him to go, the donkey stopped. And nothing was going to entice him to move. When Balaam saw that God didn't want him to go, he started looking for a way to get around it. Balaam looked for a way to get around what God wanted. He looked for a way to kind of skirt around it without getting in trouble. Even the dumb donkey was smart enough to figure out that, you know, when, when, when God blocks the path, don't go. Don't try to sneak past or get way over that way and get by maybe you won't see. So the donkey turned out to be smarter than Balaam and smarter than a few other people down through the centuries. Uh, you know, hopefully we will take heed and at least be as smart as a donkey. Uh, but uh, Balaam came down and, and they wanted Balaam to curse the Israelites and Balaam had trouble coming up with anything to do that because God wouldn't allow him to curse them. Then Balaam was inspired with a great idea. And what Balaam's idea was, was to entice the Israelites into harlotry, or in, into whoredom and idolatry. And then God would, would curse them. See, Balaam finally figured a way. He said, send these Moabite women down there and entice them. And pretty soon, you know, just get a real orgy going out there and God will get so disgusted he will curse them. So this was ba Balaam's brilliant idea. You can go through the uh, account here, Numbers 25, verse 1, Israel abode and shed him and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. 
And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined themselves to Baal Peor, and the anger of the eternal was kindled against Israel. Now, here they were on the verge of entering the promised land. They were right out within sight of the promised land, forgot about the promised land, forgot about the Ten Commandments, forgot about God, forgot about these things because, hey, man, have you seen those Moabite girls? Oh, you know, uh, let's go to the party down at, uh, you know, Moab's place. Uh, and and uh, so they went down there. And uh, the liquor was flowing and the girls were uh, uh, doing their thing. And it wasn't long before the uh, the nation, their commitment was sapped. Not because of some great trial or adversity, but because of some bait that was sort of dangled out there. And they went for it. Because their depth of commitment to God and His truth was very shallow. Very shallow. And when the bait was there, they went for the bait. Because of the shallowness of their commitment. You can go back to, uh, well, let's just notice an account in the, in the prophets in Haggai. Now, they had run into problems at the time of Haggai. In fact, interestingly enough, Ezra 7 is the parallel account uh, because Haggai was contemporary with the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And, uh, or well, with the time of Zerubbabel and Joshua, actually, who, who were predecessors of Nehemiah. Some, they were within the realm, the same lifetime, but uh, they were separated by two or three decades the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. And they had shut things down. And the people who had come back out of Babylon had been all charged up. And they were committed. They left everything behind. They came back to Jerusalem. They were really uh, coming back to do the work to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. Uh, but uh, adversity got stirred up and, and, and uh, false accusations were made to the king. A messenger arrived, delivered a court order from the court of King Artaxerxes, said, shut this thing down until I can look into the matter and make a further decision. Well, things drag on for years, and of course, uh, if you've ever been tangled up in court litigation, you realize that that shouldn't be a surprise. Things can drag on for years and years, uh, and uh, that's what happened there, and nothing particular changed. And when we pick up the story in Haggai, chapter 1, verse 2, the people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. In verse 4, he says, Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Consider your ways, God says. You've sown much, bring in little. You eat and don't have enough. You drink, you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. He that earns wages, earns wages to put it in bags with holes. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, build a house, and I'll take pleasure in it. I'll be glorified. Verse 9, you looked for much and it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew on it and it disappeared. Why? Because my house is waste and you run every man to your own houses. Now, the point was, and you can tie this in with Malachi and the the subject of tithing. The point was, the people had gotten their priorities mixed up. They had come back all charged up. Trials came on. Adversity. The work was shut down. They were threatened with persecution, and so they stopped. Then they began to get busy on what they could do, and and they got absorbed in their own business and building their own houses and do all these things. So all their resources were going into that. But you know, it was the same old rat race. They were earning wages to put them in bags with holes. You ever found you ever found that? You know, your paycheck comes like putting it in a bag full of holes, just sort of goes through, and and you know it's disappeared, gone. You know, just it doesn't matter how much you put in; it seems like it just keeps going out the bottom. That's uh, pretty descriptive of inflation, you know. It just uh, just sort of goes right through. And so, if you go through the book of Haggai and put it together with, with Ezra and with Malachi, you see that what the people were saying was, look, once we get ahead, once we get everything together and get everything lined out, once we get our stuff done and once we can afford it, then we're going to get back to the work of God. And God said, look, through Haggai, That's not the way it works. You're never going to get ahead by putting me last. You get to work and build the temple and I'll take care of everything else. So the people were stirred up and they did the work. An enticement of worldliness can can, uh, entice people away. Back several 
weeks ago, early in the summer, I had the opportunity of uh, traveling back to uh, Houston to perform a wedding. Young lady that I had known uh, as a uh, uh, as a teenager, uh, her uh, parents had both left God's church. In fact, a divorced and, and a very unfortunate situation. She uh, was a young teenager, and she continued faithfully in God's church on up through her teenage years, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, her parents had, had uh, forsaken this way of life and had turned against it. And she. Uh, uh, continue to attend church and to be very faithful and and uh, I had known her through those years and she was married early this summer. She was married to a young man that I had uh, actually taught uh, about 20 years ago in Imperial Schools. His father was one of the earliest students of Ambassador College. His father was uh, uh, Mr. Kenneth Herman uh, who uh, came out to Ambassador College in 1948, the second year of the college. He was Faculty member, uh, just retired this past year, faculty member for many, many years, uh, was the registrar of Ambassador College in Pasadena for many of those years. Uh, I had opportunity, was visiting with Mr. Herman uh, there prior to the wedding, uh, and we were talking about things, and a little bit of his experiences, and he was telling me a little bit of when he came to Ambassador College. Uh, he came to Ambassador College in 1948, uh, came from Wisconsin, in uh, an old car that, uh, uh, you know, nobody would have hardly wanted to drive out of town, much less from uh, Wisconsin to California. Uh, but uh, anyway, he had uh, uh, never met, of course, a minister, because we didn't have any ministers uh, then other than Mr. Herbert Armstrong uh, there in California and uh, Mr. Basil Wolverton, a local elder up in Oregon. And uh, But he had heard this voice on the radio, the voice of the world tomorrow, Mr. Arm- Mr. Herbert Armstrong preaching. Uh, and uh, as a uh, an older teenager had listened to this and had become convicted uh, in his mind and had decided at about age 19 that uh, he was going to travel out to Ambassador College in Pasadena, California, uh, and he wanted to learn uh, the truth of God. He wanted to do these things. Well, he got out there and he said when, when he got to, to uh, Pasadena, he was able to find that. That was on a map. Uh, he got there and he stopped at a gas station to inquire about where Ambassador College was. Well, gas station attendant never heard of it, didn't know. Uh, so uh, he started inquiring around, and uh, uh, he spent uh, quite a while. Nobody ever heard of the Ambassador College, and, and uh, you know, this would sort of give you a real uh, positive feeling. You know, you, uh, you, you're you out here, you're looking for something, uh, you're, you're showing up to a place to go to college, and you start inquiring around, and nobody in the community has ever heard of Ambassador College. Now, Ambassador College, of course, had only been operating for one year by that time, and uh, uh Finally, he found somebody that uh, was able to uh, tell him, oh, yeah, I think that thing's over there on Grove Street. And they gave him directions. He got over there, and uh, here was a building, uh, a building, uh, and, and another little building. It was a building that had originally been a house, and then there was what had been a stable, uh, originally had been a carriage house, a stable uh, that was uh, over nearby, and the uh, stable had been remodeled. Uh, it had been remodeled once by the owner to make it a garage for an old Model T, and then it had been remodeled to become the office of the Worldwide Church of God, or Radio Church of God, as it was at that time. Uh, and the other building was the college. Uh, the building that had been the house was the college. That was everything else. And uh, uh, there was a gardener out there working. Now, the gardener was not a part of the church. He was just somebody that was employed there working on the grounds. And so Mr. Herman uh, saw him. He was the only one he saw around, walked up to him and asked him uh, where, uh, you know, something about the college. He was looking for Mr. Armstrong. And the gardener said, hey, is there, there's no college. Is this just a scam? Mr. Armstrong's running to get people's money. Uh said, yeah, he says, there's not really a college here. Well, you know, that's not a real uh, encouraging thing, but uh, he finally uh, found Mr. Armstrong, and uh, he visited with Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Ar- he was asking Mr. Armstrong all these questions, and Mr. Armstrong was going through and explaining, and expl- answering his Bible questions and everything, and he was all enthused. Uh, well, you know, maybe there is a college, and, and obviously this man is teaching the truth of God, so he started asking some questions about the college. He said the only thing that... Uh, uh, he found Mr. Armstrong at all evasive on was when he started asking him, you know, a little bit about the student body things. That, that what Mr. Armstrong was wanted to take a little time to tell him was the fact that uh, there were four students uh, that had been there last year, and that was it. That was the, was the total enrollment had four students. And uh, well, what about this year? Well, so far he was the only one. 
uh, you, you know, he was it. He, he, he had shown up, and uh, he was the uh, freshman class. Uh, it's a good thing he'd shown up, because if he hadn't, there wouldn't have been a freshman class. Well, a few weeks later, uh, two brothers showed up, uh, the McNair brothers, uh, and uh, they, uh, they enrolled. So there was a freshman class of three, uh, together with the uh, previous class, uh, four, which made a grand total of seven. And then the next year, they had a real influx, had five more show up, so then they had 12. Uh, and, uh, you know, the college grew. Now, you, you know, you look at that, a lot of people look at that and say, four students, and I'm the freshman class, doesn't sound like a college to me. But, you know, if, if there hadn't been some vision and some commitment, not only on the part of Mr. Armstrong, but on the part of the students that showed up and found out, that, you know, you're it. Why didn't they leave? Say, well, boy, you know, I, this is all there is. Well, I don't think there's anything to this. I better go find me someplace I can get an education. But you see, there was a depth of commitment. They weren't in it for what they could get. There wasn't anything to get. Except the truth of God. Except, a, except uh, an education of God's truth. That's what they were there for. They were committed to something. And because they were committed, they stayed, even though they looked around and there weren't a lot of impressive buildings and there weren't, uh, you know, churches worldwide. Oh, there were about a hundred people that got together up in Belknap Springs for the Feast of Tabernacles that year. That was the feast worldwide. Worldwide attendance. But you know, within a few years, by 1951... Uh, some of those students had gotten up to the point uh, that uh, one of those McNair brothers who, who was there, Raymond McNair, uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Mr. Roderick Meredith, who'd come the third year, went out on the first nationwide baptizing tour in 1951. And we've got people right here in, in, the, uh, uh, in this general area. In fact, I know of at least one over in Baton Rouge who was baptized on that, on that first tour. And, and the work of God began to grow. Church of God began to grow because now it took a few years, but students were educated, got to a point where they were able to go out and to do things. Mr. Armstrong just physically could not be everywhere at every time. Took time, took commitment. Took commitment to, to stick with something that you don't, that, that is not right there, doesn't offer all the physical advantages. The enticement of worldliness does not undermine that sort of commitment because that's the sort of commitment that is detailed in Hebrews 11. You see, the word is translated faith in our Bible is a word that is also rendered faithfulness, and it carries with it very strongly the concept of commitment. Faith, we're told in Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith has to do with faithfulness, with commitment. Without that level of faithfulness and commitment, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it's impossible to please God. Because if you come to God, you've got to believe that God is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We find that these individuals, these men and women of faith, in verse 10 of Hebrews 11, looked for a city that has foundations whose maker and builder is God. We're told of these individuals in verse 13 that these all died in faith. They died in faith, in faithfulness. They died in dedicated commitment to the truth of God, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. They were committed to what God said. And they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see, verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared for them a city. That city is the new Jerusalem, and it's the same city that's prepared for you and for me. These individuals detailed in Hebrews 11 are going to be there because they were committed to the truth of God. They were committed through trials and adversities and tests and tribulations. They were committed past the enticements of worldliness and the allure and the attraction of the world around. They were committed to something. They believed in something. Those who came to Jesus wanting to be his disciple, he told them, it's recorded in Matthew 16, 24, he said, if any man will come after me, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to come after me, then you've got to take up your cross 
You've got to deny yourself to take up your cross and to follow me. You've got to deny the self. Convenience can't be number one priority. You've got to deny the self. You've got to take up your cross. And you've got to follow. You've got to come after me. That's the challenge of discipleship. To be Christ's disciple, to be his follower. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ takes commitment. It's not an easy time just for the good times type of religion. It takes death. Not a shallow commitment, but death. Now, Abraham and these others were committed because they looked for something. They had vision. They saw what God offered and they believed it. And it was real to them. Job was that way. Others of God's servants were that way. And we could come right on down to our time. Various ones that serve God and, and have obeyed God right on down to some of those sitting right here in this room. Ultimately, the way you endure, the way you maintain discipleship gets back to a depth of commitment. Two of the greatest enemies are either the trials and the tests that, that press us and push us away or the enticements of the world, the attraction of being like the world, the attractions and enticements of the world that, uh, that entice us away. But you know, in order to maintain that commitment, we've got to see things for what they are. We've got to see things in proper relationship. We've got to value things as they really are. Esau, we're told, despised his birthright. He did so because he treated it cheaply. Esau treated the birthright cheaply. He's used as an example of one who treated very casually and carelessly the blessings and the benefits of God. There was no depth of commitment. He was unwilling to endure, unwilling to hang on. Brethren, if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have to clearly see and understand what God holds out for us. The promises of God must be real to us. We've got to spend time drawing close to God, walking with God, drinking in of God's Spirit through prayer, through Bible study, through meditation and fasting, really drawing close to God and asking God to make these things real to us to help us deepen our level of commitment that we might be among those, as God says here, who desire a better country. They see what God promises and they desire that. Wherefore, we're told, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is not ashamed to be called the God of those who are committed to Him. We need to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow after Jesus Christ to be deeply committed to being a disciple of Jesus Christ.